My question for you this morning as we begin is, are you moving in that direction? Are you moving in that direction? Are you, are you moving in the direction where God wants to take you in your life, or are you just stuck, or are you just stagnant? Are you going through the motions? And so I want to talk to you today from a, a, a message with a real simple title, and the message, the title is simply Putting God First, Putting God First. And so let's do a little exercise right now. Um, I don't know that anybody, I don't think anybody would want the IRS to come knocking on your door and to audit your taxes, but what if when you got home today after you go to Pie 5 and get a little pizza for lunch or chips and salsa or whatever you do, um, what if when you got home this afternoon, somebody's knocking on the door, you go get up from your nap and go to the door, and the person there at the door is a life auditor. What do you mean life auditor, Jeff? What a man says, can I come in? We need to, we need to do an audit of your life. Well, I don't know that you would let him in, but if you did, he sat down at the table with you. You say, how do you, how do you audit my life? And, and so you sit down at the table with this man, and he starts to ask you questions. He says, I want to just, just poke around and look inside your brain, and if you'll just allow me to do this scan, I'll scan your brain, and I want to see, see the things that you think about throughout the day, day in and day out. Just let me do this scan, and it'll tell me where your thoughts go all the time. And when we get finished with that, if you don't mind, I would like for you to allow me to just uh, audit your, your finances. Let me, let me just look at your, 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 your bank accounts and, and where your financial resources go, and let's just see where you're spending those things. And when you get finished with that, if you would allow me to look at your calendar, and let's see where you're, you're spending your time. So, so, so where do your thoughts go? What, what do you predominantly think about? Where do you spend your money? Where do you invest your financial resources? Where, where, do you, where do you use the time that God's given you? What do you do with those things? Hmm. What, would, what conclusion would this auditor draw that is important to you based on those three factors? Because you've just told him what's really important to you based on where your thoughts go, where your money goes, where your time goes. Now, if you would just keep that thought over here to the side and connect that thought with another thought. Here's what I want you to connect that to, that that that. God wants to have a relationship with you. He really does want to have a relationship with you, because yes, because he loves you, but have you thought about this? God wants to have a relationship with you because he wants the best for you, and you know what the best thing for you is? Him. Him. If you have that close personal relationship with him, then you have everything that you need, but if you don't, then you're going to struggle, and some of you, quite frankly, in this room right now, because of your lack of relationship with God, you may have convinced yourself that you have a relationship with God, but if the life audit comes through, is it really going to show that, that you're having that kind of relationship? And because you don't have that kind of relationship with God, your life is struggling. And God would say that to you because he does not want your life to struggle. He wants you to prosper. And so you say, well, what does God want from me? Well, he doesn't want much, just, just everything. Just everything, right? Jesus just wants everything. You say, that's an awful lot to ask. Yeah, it is. It is an awful lot to ask. But when you consider that when you go all in with God and you give him everything that you have, guess what you get in return? He gives you more than you could have ever dreamed of. And you find out that, that, that you've, been, you've been playing around with trinkets all of your life, right? No, nobody wants to get something from the dime store for, for their birthday present, right? You open up a package, and it's a bunch of little, little, little shiny trinkets and nothing. And it's, it's like, okay, it's, what, what is this? You want something that has substance, something that has value, something that has weight. That's what God wants to give you, but you're playing around in the trinket box. And so, today I want to challenge you to be honest with yourself and assess where you are with God. Or maybe, better put, where is God in your list of priorities? Where is God in your life? And so I'm going to give you four things this morning. Here's the first thing. Number one, write this down. A rock-solid foundation creates rock-solid lives. A rock-solid foundation creates rock-solid lives. In Matthew 7, Jesus kind of draws a picture here for us of what that looks like. And he says in verse 24, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. Now, now stop right there just a moment. Jesus is about to tell you what's going to happen. If you, if you hear the words, now he's speaking to an audience at this point that's like you sitting there listening. Today, we're not hearing Jesus verbally say them. We're reading them. But, but what he's saying is if you read Jesus' words, New Testament words of Jesus, and you put them into practice, 
Every person who does that is like a wise man who built his house on the rock, built his house on the rock. And so Jesus goes on to say that it was a good thing that the man built his house on the rock. Why? Because, because there was a foundation that was going to be tested. Raise your hand if you've been through some tests in your life. Some of us have been through some tests in our life and failed the test miserably because our life was not built on the rock. And we find ourselves in places where we have to rebuild our life. And hopefully we've learned the hard lessons from, from the first time that, that we messed some things up and, and we rebuild right. But Jesus goes on and says, he said, the rains came down and the streams rose and the winds blew against that house, but it didn't fall because it was built on the rock. And then he goes on to say that the foolish man built his house on the sand. And the winds came, and the streams rose, the rain poured, and that sand, I mean, that, that house that was built on the sand, it fell with a terrible crash. You ever been through a crash in your life? Yeah. Nobody wants to go through those crashes. But crashes are coming. Crashes are coming. Storms are coming. Those things are coming into your life, and Jesus is telling this because he wants us to be prepared for that. So, so he's saying we should build our life on the solid rock. Well, what is that, and how do you do that? Well, the bedrock of your life, the foundation of your life, should be that you know that God created you, and you know that God loves you. Stop questioning that, church. Let me see your eyeballs right now. Those of you who are mad at God right now and think he's done all these terrible things to you and you think he's had this terrible plan for you and you think God's brought destruction, God did not bring that destruction into your life. Satan did. God loves you. God is for you. He has a plan to move you forward. And if you'd stop being mad at God and understand that he created you, he loves you, and he wants to be connected with you, then you can begin building a life that's built on the rock. A life that's built on the rock is a life that's built on the Word of God. And even if I could define that a little, be a little bit more sharp with that, for Christians in, in this age, this modern age that we live in, really our life is built on New Testament living. The Old Testament still stands. The Old Testament is still valuable and important. But it points to a Messiah, a Savior, who is coming, who will make everything right. Well, guess what? He came, and He conquered our world. And he conquered death, and he's made everything right. And he's saying, if you'll follow me, and if you'll be people who, who love God and love people and stay connected to me and get involved in the work that I have for you, that's the life that's built on the rock. The life that's built on the sand is saying, yep, I'm going to go to church every once in a while, and, and I love God, but, but I'm so focused on my, on, my, on, my, on my job. I'm so focused on making money. I'm so focused on experiences. I'm so focused on things. And yeah, I love God, and I go to church, and I do my thing every once in a while, but God is one option among many, and that house that's built on the sand, why did they call the great stock market crash in the 30s a crash? Because people's lives were built on money and stocks, and it all vanishes in just a moment. But the Word of God will never fail, and it will never fall. If you're living that life is built on the sand, I'll say this to you. I will acknowledge this to you. It seems like and it feels like for a period of time that, that man, this is easier. This is better. This feels good. And so you, you, you develop a life that if it feels good, you do it. But the problem is that God lets you live too long. Y'all think about that a minute. Some of y'all guys let you live way too long because, because if God would have taken you out a long time ago just with a little quick old heart attack or something that got you out of here, you wouldn't have to go through some stuff. But if you live that build on the sand life long enough, you're going to go through some stuff. And that thing is going to crumble and fall. It's going to crumble and fall. It can't withstand everything. It seems less restrictive. Uh, than, than allowing God to leave. But when the storms of life come, and they will come, the sand-based life has no way of standing. It always crashes. But on the other hand, statistics show us that, that following Jesus creates a solid life that's dynamic and is able to withstand the storm. So the Barna Group, I don't know if you've heard of Barna, but the Barna Group is a, is a research organization that, that does all kinds of research to provide insights on the, the trends affecting faith and culture. And I want to show you a few statistics that the Barna Group has published based on their research focused on people of faith. Look at this. Uh, based on Barna, practicing Christians versus other Americans, practicing Christians, sense of purpose, 77% of practicing Christians have a sense of purpose versus 48% of other Americans. 
just drifting, half of the other Americans. Uh, 50% of practicing Christians volunteer their time compared to 29% who say, my time is mine and I'm not giving anything to anyone else. Charitable giving, same thing. 81% of practicing Christians engage in charitable giving, giving to something that they're not getting anything back from versus 42% of other Americans. And notice the last one, how all of those factors contribute. Practicing Christians, uh, Barter Research Group say 72% of practicing Christians live a very satisfied life compared with only 53% of other Americans. Those other Americans, 47% of them are saying, I do not live a very satisfied life. You know what's interesting about this? What, what Barna considers to be practicing Christians, three factors. One, self-identify as a Christian. Two, attends church at least once a month. And three, considers their faith to be very important. Can I say to you that's a very low bar? I go to church once in a while, consider myself a Christian, and my faith is important. That's not saying that, that these are people who sacrifice and give and go and put Jesus first. It really is just saying cultural Christians. And if people whose bar is that low are experiencing those kinds of results, what do you think happens with people who say, Jesus, I'm going all in with you? When you read the Word of God in the New Testament and those real people who follow Jesus, you see what happens, man. They went in with him, and they went on journeys. And they left the humdrum, boring life behind, and God took them on adventure. And I'm saying to you this morning that God has so much more for you if you will build a life with a foundation that is in Jesus. Let's go to the second thing, number two. Spirit-led living straightens out the sketchy roads. Spirit-led, letting the Holy Spirit of God lead you in your life. Man, I'm telling you what, that's a mouthful right there. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Y'all ever heard that before? You might want to bookmark that one. You might want to take that little pen and, 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 and draw a circle around that one in your book. You might want, if you got an iPad, man, just make that thing turn yellow, however you do it. Um, have you ever been through a season of your life that challenged everything about you? In 2014, I ran into one of these seasons, ran into a head first when my first wife passed away. Those of y'all who have been with me for a while, you've heard this story lots of times, but some of y'all who are newer, have, I've not shared this story with you, and I'm going to tell it again. Some of y'all are like, yeah, I've heard this over and over. Well, I'm going to keep telling it because it's my story, and I saw how God worked in it, and God changed my life through this. On that certain morning, um, I had gone to the hospital to, to, to meet with someone. I came back home, sat down, and my, my, my first wife, her name was Melissa. We, she had been having some health problems, uh, some, some issues, but we didn't know it was anything serious. Thought she had pulled a muscle in her back. Uh, she had been struggling with it on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. On Monday morning, I sat down and talked with her, and she said, something's not right. I said, you're right, it's not. You need to go to the hospital. We need to get you up and get you cleaned up. She gets up to get ready to go to the hospital walks from the recliner in the living room into the kitchen and I heard her fall and when she fell I thought she had just kind of like 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 when your back seizes up on you what I thought was happening was her back had just seized up and she kind of gone to the floor but my my daughters came daddy you need to come here daddy 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 and I go in there and, and she's on the floor and without going through all the details she was essentially gone at that point um the, the, the ambulance came, and they picked her up, and they took her, and they thought she was having a stroke, or we got to go, we got to go, we got to go. And within just a few moments, um, I am at the uh, emergency room. I'm at the emergency room and uh, pull up to the front desk there, and they say, we're going to ask you to walk back to the chapel. The, the chaplain's going to come see you with the ER doctor. And I'd been in ministry long enough to know what that meant, and it wasn't good. And so at that point, um, they came in and told me what was going on, and she had had a massive aneurysm, and the doctor said if she had been on the operating table and we'd already had her open, there still would have been nothing that we could do. And in just a moment, everything in my world turned upside down. And we had just started this church. Um, we, this church was about a year old. I was living in Eden, trying to pastor a brand-new church in Danville, had four kids at that point, uh, 
you know, a 17-year-old, a 15-year-old, a 9-year-old, and a 6-year-old, and all of a sudden I'm trying to figure out how to be dad and mom at the same time and pastor a church that was in a town over from where I was. People have said to me after that season, Jeff, how did you get through that? Jeff didn't get Jeff through that. Can I tell you that? This, these two verses, when I didn't know what my name was, when I didn't know which direction to go, when I, every day, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how I'm going to do this. Man, y'all should have seen your boy in there washing those girls' clothes and uh, putting outfits together and hanging them up in their closet because I'm getting tired every morning getting up and the, the, trying to get the girls ready to go to school. Daddy, I ain't got nothing to wear. Yes, you do. It's hanging up in your closet. I done matched it up in sets for you. Come on. Think I can't. Think I can't do it. That's about all I knew how to do, though. And I thank God for that season because people showed up. God sent people into my life to show up to help me with things that I didn't know how to do. And God, 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 put, put, God put people around me, and I was so confused. And it was, like, it was like everything I knew, it was just turned upside down. You ever take one of those snow globes, man, and shake the thing and turn it upside down, and everything just goes all kinds of ways? That's what my life did. But when I look back on that season, and day after day, I'm like, God, I don't know what I'm doing. And then God just impresses on my heart, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. And I learned how to trust in God when it doesn't make sense. And I learned how to not try to understand a thing. And I learned how to acknowledge him in all my ways. And I want to say to you, man, you're going to go through hard things, but when you acknowledge God and you're, you're able to say to God, God, I trust you. I don't understand why I'm going through this. I don't know what you're doing. I don't know how I'm going to get in, get out of it. But God, I'm trusting in you. I'm holding on to you. He will show up. He will pull you through it. He will take you out the other side. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Because why? Because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Some of you who are going through that valley of the shadow of death right now, you need to understand, don't go through it on your own. you got to hold on to God. Stay close to Him, and He'll pull you out. And so at just the right time, when I didn't know what my middle name was, God sent Jackie Lynch to me, and within a year from all of that stuff happening, it wasn't the most popular decision, but Jackie and I were married a little bit over a year after that, and we moved from, from Eden to Danville, and our whole life changed, and God gave us a whole new life, and He changed everything, and He turned it around. And when he says, I'll give you beauty for ashes, I have lived that over and over and over. And I wonder if there's anybody else in the room that would stand to your feet right now because God's given you beauty for ashes. Hey, hey, hey. Thank you, Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. That spirit-led living, man. You don't have to figure it all out. you got to let him show you. What is it you're facing in your life that feels like it's going to crush you, feels like it's impossible? If you try to do it on your own, it will crush you. But if you trust God to work it out, believe in him, don't give up, keep holding on, keep talking to him, he's going to work it out. Billy Graham said the Holy Spirit is the one who brings us to Christ. And he is the one who guides us day by day, showing us how to live and helping us when we're tempted to go astray. That is spirit-led living. Number three, let's go to the third thing. A foundation of faith can calm your anxiety. I don't know who deals with anxiety in this room, but my guess is probably 80%, 90%, 100% of us. Everybody's anxious about something, worried, nervous, uh, upset. But, but look at what Paul writes to the church at Philippi, a church of Christians that the Apostle Paul, who walked with Jesus, who had a very close and personal relationship with the Lord, he writes to the church at Philippi, and he says, do not be anxious about anything. Stop right there. Are you a Christian, or are you a person who is of, of the world? If you are a follower of Jesus, our ways are different than the ways of the world. And Paul's telling the people who have become believers and followers of Jesus, I know you got a lot on you. I know you're worried about a lot of things. I understand that there's things that you can't control. I understand that you don't know how it's going to work out, and it looks like the worst is coming. But the apostle Paul says, you are a Christian. You have the Holy Spirit of God. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. And if I have access to that, 
why am I worried about what I can do or I can't do? Why am I anxious about what they're going to do to me? I'm going to hold on to Jesus, and no matter what anybody else does, I'm going to take advantage of that. And he says, don't be anxious about anything. Y'all are like, Psh, easy for you to say, Paul. Yeah, 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 yeah. This man put everything he had on the line, and he saw the power of God give him what? Peace in his heart through every circumstance. And so he says, you don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And we're Christians, but we run to other things more quickly than we run to the Word of God. What do we run to? Well, y'all know some of the things we run to, man, caffeine. Bro, don't, listen, don't even mess with me. I love me some coffee. Don't even mess with me. Let your boy get about three cups of coffee, though. That hand starts getting like that, right? Uh, I told him, those guys out at the coffee thing here a minute ago, I said, don't y'all give me about a half a cup. I will show out this morning. I didn't have too much already. We love that caffeine, but you get too much of it, it'll, it'll make you anxious. But you know what doesn't make you anxious? Jesus. Come on, get you some of that. Uh, you know what else causes anxiety? Drugs do. Talk to people who have, have, been, have been convinced over and over and over that, that drugs is the answer to whatever. Man, I, I, just, I just don't want to deal with life. I, I want to feel something. I don't want to feel anything. Go on, get you a whole batch of them. Get your mouth slammed full of drugs and watch what happens. It will cause you anxiety. It causes you anxiety. Have I taken too much? Am I not taking enough? What if they know? Am I acting right? Am I what? And it just creates all this anxiety. You know what does not cause anxiety? Jesus. That's right. You know what else? People say, people say, man, my nerves are shot. I hear people say it all the time. My nerves are shot. I need a cigarette. I need a drink. That will cause you anxiety. Trampas, man, you look a whole lot better than you did when I first met you, man. You look, got, got a calm about you. That, that Jack Daniels, Jim Bean, it, would, it wasn't treating you right, man. It wasn't treating you right. And there's so many more in here that that thing creates anxiety. But you know who does not create anxiety? Jesus. Come on. Get some of that this morning. I want you to notice the progression of those verses, though. I want you to notice the progression because you get this down in your spirit, and there's a prayer that now you can take hold of. He says, when you start feeling like there's something to be anxious about, what does he say? He says, don't be anxious about anything. And you know what that is, church? That's a choice. It is a choice that I'm not going to let this thing get me all, all jammed up, worried about things in my heart. I am not going to. He says, he says do not be anxious about, every, about anything, but in all things by prayer. Somebody tell me what prayer is. Talking to God. That's right. Good answer. You get a new car. No. <laughs> prayer is simply talking to God. So don't be anxious. Start talking to God. God, I'm starting to feel anxious right now. God, my, my hands are... I'm, I'm, my heart's starting to race and my palms are getting sweaty. God, I'm thinking about that situation again. It's making me angry. God, stop. Do not be anxious about anything, but in all things by prayer. And then the word is either by petition or supplication. It's saying you're going to bring your junk to God. Y'all know how you do in your little neighborhood there when, when somebody wants to put a stoplight up at the sign. Let's get us a little petition, get everybody write it up, take it to the right people, say, we need a stop sign out here. Well, maybe you need to take a petition to God. Say, God, I need you to get this jerk off my back. He's been messing with me all day, right? You take that thing to God. But here's the one I love. He says, don't be anxious about anything, but in all things by prayer and supplication or petition and with thanksgiving. Why does he add that in there? Because we're people of faith, aren't we? We, we believe in things that we can't even see yet. And so when we thank him in advance, God, I thank you that you're going to clean this mess up for me before I even get there. I believe that you're working for me. Come on, y'all, I need y'all to take hold of this. This will change your life when you start telling God thank you for something that he hasn't even delivered to you. It shows him that you believe and you have faith, and God always operates in faith. And then it says the, the, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds. All of us who are anxious, anxious people, that's how we get out of it. Last thing, number four, blessings flow out of putting God first. We saw this verse a few weeks ago. I love it. I've fallen in love with this verse because when you take all of that money stuff and boil it down, don't worry about do I tithe, do I not tithe, what do I do, all of those things. Look at what Proverbs 3, 9, and 10 says. It says, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops, then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. 
What would your life look like if you really believe? Listen to me. What would your life look like if you really believe not only that God can bless you, but that he wants to bless you? How much differently would you operate? How, how different would, God, would your life if you put God first in everything, and especially your finances, even when it's hard to do it, even when it doesn't make sense to give? How much different would your life be? Did you notice the promise that he gave you in Proverbs 3, 9, and 10? Go back and look at that. He says, if you will do this, then this will happen. You don't see the word if, but what he's saying is if you will honor him. What's honor? Honor is, is saying, God, I'm going I'm I'm to I'm recognize where this comes from. God, I'm going to recognize that all the finances that is coming into my life, it's coming from you. God, I wouldn't have had the breath to get out of bed this morning. God, I wouldn't have had this job, but you blessed me with it, and you brought it back into me. And God's saying, that's good. Thank you for acknowledging that. Thank you for recognizing that. And when you honor him with your wealth, right, with your wealth, that's the money that you have, that's your income. And then he says, with your first fruits. Honor him with your wealth and with your first fruits. And this was written in an agricultural society, which is not where we are. But our first fruits is the first money that comes to us. He doesn't give you a dollar figure there. He doesn't give you a percentage. But he says if you will honor him with your wealth and with your first fruits. What does that look like? You get money, whether you find a $20 bill on the ground, whether you get paid, whether your tax money comes back. God brings money into your life, and you stop, and you take the time to think, this came from God. You have blessed me with this. And you say, God, I want to thank you for this. I want to honor you. It came from you. I wouldn't have it if it weren't for you. I see how you love me, God. I'm going to give you a portion of it back. Listen, you figure out what portion you want to give back. Make it more about the honor and more about the first fruits. Watch what God does in that. What does he say? He makes you a promise. If you will honor him with your wealth and your first fruits, what does he say? Your barns will be filled and your vats will be brimming over. Well, we don't have barns and vats, but we have bank accounts. And we have 401Ks, and we have those things. I want you to think about what God was telling these people. These were farmers. How do you get a vat of wine that's brimming over? How do you get a barn full? If you think about that, 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 that farmer or that, that guy that owned the vineyard, he planned that we're going to have this many barrels or vats of wine this year because I've got this many, this many uh, 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 grapes in my vineyard, this many plants, so I'm expecting my harvest is going to be this many. Maybe I'll get a couple extra barrels in case everything comes in better than I expected to. But when the harvest came in, I had more grapes that produced more wine than the barrels that I had set up that I was expecting more than. Y'all aren't hearing what I'm saying to you. God's the one who made the sunshine. God's the one who made the rainfall. God's the one who made the ground fertile for the grapes to come up and the grapes to hit the thing. And he gave them more wine because this was a person who was living a life of putting God first and honoring God with their wealth and with their first fruits. And he's telling you today, listen, God wants you to stop praying for God to give you what you need. I'm not preaching some prosperity gospel to you. I'm preaching the word of God. You see it right here. He doesn't want you to pray for what you need. He wants you to pray for more than why. Not so that you can hoard it all up and get, get all the stuff, but so that you'll have more than you need so that you can help someone else. I've known some amazing godly people who were financially blessed, and their blessings had nothing to do with the stuff that they had, but it had everything to do with how they could help the next one and the next one and the next one. You are a city on a hill. That's what Jesus told us. Let's be that. He's showing us how to do it. But it's got to start by putting God first. And I want you to believe it, man. Tony Evans says God will meet you where you are in order to take you where he wants you to go. So right now, this morning, my prayer is that something that's been said from the Word of God has touched something in your heart. Because God wants you to know that wherever you are today, maybe you've been walking with him throughout a lifetime and you're putting him first. He'll meet you right there. But he's going to project you farther into the future. There's more things that he wants you to do. But the inverse of that is true too. And if you're someone who's far from God, and God is distant to you, or God is one option in a list of options, if you'll just meet him right where you are, he'll meet you right there, and he'll take your life so much further. But it's got to start with a decision. And so my question to you today is simple. Now, what are you going to do with God? Would you just bow your heads and close your eyes right there for a moment?
Just take a moment of silence and contemplate that question. Now, what am I going to do with God? Now that the Holy Spirit of God is speaking to you, He's showing you where you are. It's your turn to respond to Him. If He's telling you that He's kind and patient and good, and He wants to pour out so much good in your life. Forget about the money part of it. What about, what about the peace that He wants to give you? What about the purpose that He wants to put into your life? What about what about how he wants to use you and your story and the things that you've been through and your pain to help someone else and to be a blessing? What if God could give you more than you ever dreamed of? And that's all I've ever seen. Anybody I've known who has met God right where they are and said, God, I'm taking my hands off. I'm putting you first. You lead and I'll follow. I've only seen God take them into deeper waters, into better places. So why would he do anything different with you? Say, Jeff, what are you asking me to do? I'm asking you to trust him with everything you have. But right now, that begins with a personal relationship with Jesus as you're sitting there in those seats. If you know, I'm not, talk, I'm not asking you, have you been saved? Have you been baptized? I'm asking you right now, in this moment, in this season of your life, are you as close to God as he wants you to be? Do you know that you have a personal relationship with him where Jesus Christ is your Lord and your Savior? Not just your Savior, not just I'm going to die and go to heaven one day, but he is my Lord and he is guiding my decisions and I am following him. My guess is there's probably some folks here today who cannot say that Jesus really is my Lord. You've been living that life that's built on the sand and you can see how it's beginning to crumble and you know if something doesn't change that the crash is coming. Jesus is saying to you today, I love you too much to let that crash happen. Get off of the sand, and let's build on the solid rock. So right now is your opportunity. With nobody looking around, every head bowed, I'm not asking you to stand or come forward. But if right now, today, you want to give your life to Jesus and begin building a life that's built on the solid rock, as I count from three backwards to one, would you just raise your hand to acknowledge before God that you want to give your life to him right now? Three, two, one. Hands raised. Praise God. There's three hands, four. Amen. You can put those hands down. Would you just have a conversation with God right now? And just tell him, God, I raise my hand to acknowledge to you that I'm asking you to save me today. Lord, today, I'm putting all of my faith in you. And I believe that because of your blood that was shed at the cross, that my sin now has been washed away. I never have to ask you to save me again because you've done it right now. You've given me forgiveness, and you've given me freedom. Lord, I ask you to be my Lord. Help me to follow you. I place all of my faith in you, Jesus. You are the way, the truth, and the life. And through you, I'm stepping into a brand new relationship with my Heavenly Father. Holy Spirit of God, I pray right now over this congregation, both online and in the house, that I ask you, Lord, to bring healing to hearts. God, I pray that you will bring the right priority. Bring alignment, God. God, I pray that you will illuminate hearts right now and convict and show us, God, our lives that are out of order, where we have things in front of you. And I pray that you will give the courage, the wisdom, and the grace to make decisions in this moment, to lay everything else down, and to put you in first place so that you can pour out everything on us that you want us to have. And we give all of this to you right now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Church, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet right now. Stand up and stretch out real big. Get some blood flowing here. Come on, stretch out. Now, I have, I have issued a challenge to you to consider where you are. The team's going to sing a song for us. Once again, this altar is open. Life change does not take place because of what you think or what you believe. Life change takes place because of what you do. Sometimes the first step in doing something is to take a step and hit this altar, make some commitments to God, and let Him begin changing. If you know that your life is out of order right now, I'm asking you as they begin to sing, make your way down to this altar, have a conversation with the Lord, and let Him work things out in your life. Do not leave this place today without getting alignment in your life with the, with the 
King of kings and Lord of lords. You come as they sing.